and welcome to the Scotta Chronicast, the podcast which discusses all things relating to medieval Scotland. I'm your host, Dr. Kate Buchanan. This is episode 15, and I am excited to be joined by Joanna Richardson. Welcome to the Scotta Chronicast. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for joining me today to chat. I'm very much looking forward to this. Would you mind introducing yourself to the listeners a little bit? Uh, Not at all. Um, I'm Joanna Richardson, and I'm currently studying a PhD at the University of Edinburgh, um, looking at Barber's Bruce. So if you heard Callum talk a few weeks ago about that, then you'll already know a bit about that. Mm -hmm. But I'm interested in the sections of it that deal with the Scottish invasion of Ireland and just, uh, yeah, bits about Ireland in general. Cool. Yeah, that's that's always a like super interesting um, part of Scottish history that often gets kind of glossed over, the invasion of Ireland part. Yes, yeah. Not many people know about it that I've met. So Yeah, it's always a part that I had always wanted to look into more when reading and, and teaching and stuff and just never had gotten around to it. So I'm looking forward to this. But before we get too much further, what kind of drew you to study medieval Scottish history? That's a good question. Um, I've been encouraged, (laughs) um, actually, listening to the podcast and hearing people's various journeys (laughs) to get to Scottish history, because in many ways, I felt a bit like an interloper into medieval Scottish history before my PhD. So it's nice to hear that Uh come from quite different (laughs) um, uh, reaches. But I, I was thinking back, I think, my first foray into Scottish history was um, reading Robert Louis Stevenson's Kidnapped when I was 17. Um, oh, nice. Which, yeah, <laughs> yeah, for those of you who don't know, it's not a history book. It's a, a novel. Um, but it uh, really opened up my eyes to a bit of Scottish history I knew nothing about. I knew nothing about the Jacobites or yeah, this entire period of Scottish history where lots of people were kind of uh, had to hide and various bits of clan culture were uh, yeah not allowed under the law and that kind of thing. And it just kind of Mm-hmm. In my mind a little bit. It was one of those moments where you learn something and you think, how have I never been told <laughs> that this right. thing before? Um, so yeah, so for that point, I just kind of was quite interested in Scottish history and also Welsh and Irish history from a similar kind of realisation that there's stuff you don't necessarily learn in English history, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is quite interesting. Yeah, And that was just kind of what I did for fun. And then um, I did my undergraduate degree in the University of Leicester and I studied mm-hmm. English literature and history so for those of you that have done a joint degree or know of joint degrees you don't generally get to pick that many modules because you do the core modules in each kind of right. one so I kind of didn't get that much choice until um until kind of the end of my degree and I really weirdly my um, undergraduate dissertation was actually post-colonial history um in oh, New Zealand, which was <laughs> not anything to do with what I do now um which kind of came about because I remember sitting in a lecture about our dissertations and they said oh if, if you can use an archive that's foreign you you get extra points for that it looks quite good and um my parents were in New Zealand at the time because we kind of lived there when I was a teenager um so I I went back for the summer from England to New Zealand so I thought ah you can use an archive yeah um so yeah I ended up studying like um indigenous forms of Christianity and how that related to resistance to colonialism um oh super cool which was really fun but nothing to do with Scotland um but my second (laughs) choice um on the form if this hadn't worked out was to study medieval Scottish history because mm-hmm. I'd done like a survey course in my final year from like 13th, 14th century English um, history. So all the Edwards, mm-hmm. Edward the first, the second, the third, mm-hmm. and kind of done the thing where you're kind of reading a book for an essay and there's a really like brief mention of a thing and that this was the Scottish invasion of Ireland. And I thought, wait, what is that? <laughs> that sounds <laughs> really weird. And I've never heard this before. Um, and it's also yeah. connected to a lot of um, letters that get written about ideas of making this kind of pan-Celtic union, like buddying up the Scottish, mm. the Irish and the Welsh against the English. And I thought, oh, that sounds right. like a big deal. Why is, again, why has no one ever told me this before? Yeah. So I, yeah, so that was my second choice that didn't happen um, <laughs> at the time. But uh, as these things go, I kind of like put that in the back of my head and ended up mm-hmm. doing a master's at Edinburgh because I kind of done a bit of research um, and mm-hmm. found out they do a master's in Scottish history which sounded right. like from my reading as a teenager like the best thing ever I was like that's exactly what I want to yeah. study because um, <laughs> I've never got to do this yet so I went and did that course which is a great course you get to do a lot of different stuff so I did a bit of medieval but I did all the way through to 20th century British cinema so oh, it's cool. a range um, which was good but, yeah. um, again it came to dissertation time and I thought oh what would I, what would I like to do and again the little bit of my head that had remembered about 
the Scottish invasion of Ireland, thought I'd really like to dig into that a bit more. Seems like there's a bit more yeah. there to learn. So I, I looked up who, who would do that at Edinburgh and I came across um, Professor Steve Boardman mm-hmm. and went to have a chat to him about this. I said, oh, I've, I'm interested in this this thing that happened, <laughs> um, uh, the Scottish invasion of Ireland. And he got very excited and said, have you ever read John Barber's The Bruce? I said, no. Um, so he sent right. me away to read it. Um, which, yes, as Callum said, is, is a very very fun read <laughs> yeah. in a lot of ways it's just it's very it's just very enjoyable as far as um medieval texts go actually um yeah yeah so I read it and just loved it <laughs> in a lot of different ways thought there was a lot to get out of it um yeah yeah and thought uh, it was really interested by so there's about 10 percent of the text and it's quite a hefty thing that talks about the Scottish invasion of Ireland so it's quite substantial in the whole thing Mm -hmm. and you read it and it's just a bit strange the way it's kind of fitted into the narrative is what it's doing it's quite a change of tone so the literary side of my Uh. training got really excited and thought oh there's something going on here with right what this is doing in the text um but most scholars in history and Scottish history anyway hadn't really talked about this at all so I went back to Steve um, a little bit terrified because <laughs> when you read, especially this, the period that that's in, the 14th century in the Scottish Wars of Independence, there's some really big Scottish historian names <laughs> that are written yeah. about it. When you're going in and yep. kind of saying, oh, I think maybe these people might not be quite right when they're talking <laughs> about this. Um, I was ready <laughs> to get hit down <laughs> very quickly. Um, right. But Steve was like, no, I think you've got a point. That's very interesting. Let's look at that. Um, so that's yeah. what I did for my master's um, and yeah started to try and look at the Irish sections of the Bruce and try and work out in more detail what was going on yeah yeah but then realized that if I really wanted to go through the text as I said it's reasonably large in the way I wanted to that scope probably wouldn't fit a master's so right I ended up kind of writing an initial survey and at the end kind of saying oh and someone should definitely do this in more depth um <laughs> you know with the kind of um <laughs> silent bit underneath and that should be me um let me do a page right please. um yes but they did so <laughs> i got to come back and work with steve so that's what i'm doing now i'm kind of expanding on that so that's how it ended up here um yes a bit winding <laughs> cool well yeah i really like well i think it's very important uh for people to to look at various different parts of history as well, um, rather than just like completely focusing on medieval Scotland and nothing else, because you really, I think, have a broader context and having, you know, sort of cross-disciplinary skills really Mm -hmm. helps you in in looking at your sources and stuff. So that's super cool. Mm, Definitely. And I found, um, so I'd I'd never lived in Scotland until I did my master's either. So moving up Mm. here um, has also been, especially in recent years, um, is quite an eye-opening experience for an English person who might not have known much about Scottish politics or anything like that. Um, Right. So doing a a Scottish master's that um, in some ways did quite the span of Scottish history was quite useful. I still find it useful for kind of yeah. working out what's going on now. So yeah, no, yeah. that's that's very true. It can yeah definitely be helpful in interpreting <laughs> current events. Yeah, so let's uh, talk a little bit more about what you're finding in. Or I know you said your master's was more of a survey, but what's a good summary of of what you what you surveyed? I guess so basically. What is interesting about the Bruce is one that it spends so much time talking about the invasion of Ireland, which is um, the yeah. most noticeable thing, which is part of the Scottish Wars of Independence. Um, not that it gets talked about much. Um, in, I was going to say, it's, yeah. it doesn't really get I mean, much other primary source material no not not in scotland there's a lot in ireland yeah um, mainly because oh yeah a lot of chronicle people are like oh this man turned up and burned a lot of things and um yeah <laughs> it wasn't great um yeah in a lot more <laughs> actually they're a lot more harsh than that um yeah right imagine yeah yeah, <laughs> um, yeah it's set it's set island it's quite this is the thing it's quite a big deal in irish history actually because it's set it's set island back um some people think uh, several hundred years and because there was also a famine and there was a lot of destruction so it's quite a big deal Uh, for them but it it only really seems to turn up as a footnote in Scottish history yeah yeah which is is interesting itself so that that's interesting and the Bruce is also interesting because there's kind of three historical theories about why the Scots decided to invade Ireland in the middle of fighting mm-hmm. the English because um, that hadn't been resolved yet at all. Right. No. No. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's always struck me as like, that's a, you got distracted. Um. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's still a bit of a mystery, but the, the three ideas is that one, it was kind of a diverting tactic. So if the English had to fight on two fronts because mm. um, they were ruling Ireland at the time um, and it might stop 
supplies coming from Ireland to the, the English fighting the Scots. So right. there's that theory from a very practical perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also this theory because the Bruce brothers, um, so that's Robert Bruce and Edward Bruce, mm-hmm. wrote... I just I like calling them the Bruce Brothers. Um, I know. I was just thinking that's a that's a I like that. <laughs> it's my shorthand in all my notes. It's great. Um, yeah, yeah. But they they write about the conflict and they kind of write to the Irish. And um, there's also this declaration called the Irish Remonstrance, which talks about this being um, kind of a unity of of peoples who have a similar origin. So this idea that they're kind of both Celtic peoples, the Scots and the Irish, mm-hmm. and that the Irish have like invited Edward Bruce to come and become king of um, Ireland to kind of liberate them from the English. Um, which is is very interesting rhetorically, but no one's ever kind of worked out whether that's actually true or whether they just said it. Right. Um, hmm. But there's that theory. And then there's the third theory, which is the only one that Barbara actually mentions, which is why it's quite interesting, is that Edward Bruce himself was just this very um, arrogant man who just really wanted to be in charge and he couldn't cope with the fact that he'd have to share power with Robert in some way to be like a, I don't know, mm-hmm. not king but something under him in that respect. So he kind of demanded that he'd get a kingdom and so he decided to go conquer Ireland to do this and kind of Robert just mm. saw it as a good way of getting rid of him, basically. <laughs> right. um, yeah, which always struck me as a slightly, um, seems a bit oversimplified to me. Yeah. I, um, but that's that's what the Bruce says happens, and a lot of historical huh. uh, historians who have written after have kind of said, "Oh, as we all know, Edward Bruce was just a bit overexcited and you know <laughs> arrogant." And funnily enough, it's only Barber and I think one other source. So that would be um, a bit of Forden's John of Forden's work that actually mentions it. Right. So it's not exactly um, well testified in the record. So that's the interesting thing about that I picked up in the survey. So then the question was, why does he do that? Why does Barber decide that's his angle? Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is a bit more complicated. (laughs) I haven't entirely worked out, but there's some interesting reasons why he might. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I guess I didn't quite realize. I mean, I knew there were not very many sources that talk about it on the the Scottish side, but I, I guess I didn't realize it was quite that limited. Yes, most people, so Bauer, in the Scottish Quarter Home, also mm-hmm. talks about it, but he just says, um, he kind of does a summary of some of those theories and then just says, see Barber. So a lot of people just go, right. go read John Barber, because why would you not? Um, it's Right. Yeah. So <laughs> it's a bit of a problem for working out if that's actually true or not. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we all know what he wrote was absolutely true. Yeah. Just go read him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Yeah, you said there were a couple of different theories you might have. Um, Do you want to talk about those? Yeah. Uh, Yeah, no, I can. So, so far, I've spent my first kind of thing that I spent looking at was uh, chivalry. So I'm approaching Barber's Bruce in quite a literary way. So I'm kind of trying to work out Mm -hmm. um, because Barber's Bruce is quite a complicated text. So it's it's history, but it's also written with quite a lot of influences from um, like uh, chivalric romance and various different kind of literary uh, styles. So it's kind of doing Mm -hmm. different things at once. So I'm kind of treating it as a narrative as well, just kind of trying to work out, yeah, why Ireland's in there in the first place and why Edward Bruce gets such a bad rap. Because interestingly yeah. enough, um, up, up until he's also in the rest of the text because he just does stuff in the Scottish Wars of Independence. He does a lot of the fighting with Robert and the other famous um, people from the Scottish Wars of Independence. Yeah. Um, and up until the point where Ireland comes into the narrative, he's like amazing. He gets described in all the same ways as everyone else. He's really great at fighting and he's very chivalric and bold and all the superlatives you could give. Um, mm-hmm. but it's like halfway through the Irish expedition that suddenly he becomes almost like, oh, now he's horrible and now he's not very good at leading armies and he's arrogant. And all mm. that stuff. So it's a very, it's a very Jekyll and Hyde kind of huh. fiction. So one of the things I looked at was trying to look at um, chivalry and how that might be changing what these characters are kind of symbolizing in the text. Cause as some literary scholars have written about the fact, and as has Callum, so I read a lot of his, <laughs> his mm-hmm. PhD, <laughs> I have to say, um, that Barbara is kind of trying to create something of a new version of chivalry that's a bit more pragmatic than maybe some of the versions of chivalry that have come before, just because the Scots have to do a lot of stuff that might not be quite so chivalric technically mm. um, during the Scottish Wars of Independence, just because they're um, the underdogs massively. Um, right. There's this idea that Robert is obviously, as the King of Scotland, the epitome of chivalry. And there's a couple of characters mm-hmm. he's kind of compared with, and one is Edward Bruce. And the idea is that um, Edward Bruce's form of chivalry is more like the traditional form of chivalry. So you must never give up, always fight to the death, um, do it for right. your honour. That is kind of ideas, um, mm-hmm. which is part of the downfall in Ireland. So the 
the Irish invasion ends effectively in 1318 when um, Edward is killed and the most of the Scottish army is defeated really badly um, yeah. <laughs> in 1318. Yeah, and um, a lot of that is supposedly down to the fact that Edward was massively outnumbered but wanted to fight anyway, wouldn't wait for reinforcements. You know, we must fight mm. for honour. So there's, a, there's an idea from like a textual perspective that that's just, that, that side of Edward is kind of, beefed up a little bit to really make the mm-hmm. point that this is not very useful <laughs> as a thing right. to do. Don't be like Edward, be like Robert. Um, right. I, which I definitely think is part of it. But still, there's still this, like, Edward's character is, is not the same through the whole text. So this is the question that I'm still trying to work out, is why does it change so rapidly? Yeah. Is that something to do with either where Barbara gets his source from for the Irish sections, or something to do with Ireland itself and how Ireland mm-hmm. is viewed in the late 14th century when this is getting written which is the kind of other theory that I haven't gone into so much yet but would like to because I'm I'm always very interested in culture and kind of Mm -hmm. uh, how people develop their cultural identity through literature but also yeah that relationship between literature and how people view themselves and and others yeah Um, so I'm really interested whether Barb is either reflecting kind of a a negative view of Ireland or the sense that they don't really want to dwell too much on the fact that any of this even happened um right <laughs> yeah <laughs> the best forgotten uh, <laughs> sweep it under the rug yeah. as best you can <laughs> yeah um or yeah especially because he doesn't mention any of the kind of collaborative aspect of this or the idea that the, the scots and the irish mm. are from the same nation all that's very out of vogue at the end of the 14th century when before it right. had been more popular so i'm I'm, yeah. I'm yeah i'm interested whether ireland itself has kind of given edward bruce a bad reputation or whether edward has given ireland a bad reputation <laughs> if that makes right. sense like which way around is that kind of connotation yeah gone but yeah so that's that's being expanded on a bit more so i've started looking at kind of edward as a king because the other interesting thing is that he doesn't Barber never calls him king he just says right. the Irish called him king which is a bit ominous <laughs> from his perspective yeah he doesn't think <laughs> he really was um so I'm trying to find out if there's any records of, of Edward being a king and what that might have been like compared to maybe sort of Robert's view of kingship and how he's described as a king and whether we can kind of work out whether he right. was bad or again whether there's like a, a, a very specific attempt to make Edward look bad um mm-hmm. for whatever reason so um, so I'm looking a lot at kingship at the moment and Irish high kingship, yeah. which is another fun, <laughs> slightly complicated idea. Yeah, very complicated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I have to say I haven't got my head around that. Yeah. But yeah, so at the moment I'm spending a lot of time looking at a lot of Irish chronicles, which is fun and something I haven't done before. Yeah. And hence I get to read all the fun descriptions of what they thought about Edward Bruce because they weren't particularly, most of them weren't particularly complimentary. But again, they were <laughs> being attacked. So yeah. yeah. Um, yeah of course <laughs> it's like oh this lovely person came and he killed my family yeah no. exactly <laughs> cool so i mean other than finding that they didn't particularly like uh edward bruce <laughs> what are you finding um in the irish sources that really um, is it shedding any light on sort of the situation of the scots coming into ireland at the moment um I need to dig a bit deeper, actually. I, st- I started down the rabbit hole of um, <laughs> yeah. to, uh, Trace, where like the first references of different ideas were coming from, um, which my supervisor told me to kind of divert away from for a while because I was supposed to be writing something else, um, right. <laughs> as happens with a PhD. You, you know, it's so easy to get distracted. <laughs> yeah, it really is, especially um, trying to do everything online at the moment. Um, it's a yeah. form of distraction. Uh, <laughs> yes. following links to other things and trying to work out whether this is actually a manuscript or someone's just uploaded it onto the internet um right from who knows where um yeah yeah um, it's especially challenging yeah yeah um but yeah, but it's it's fun it's enjoyable um yeah so mostly the thing i found most interesting about the irish sources at the moment is they also spend a lot of time saying like oh the, the, the edward calls himself king that it wasn't you know, he's not the king of Ireland, just certain people mm. called him king. But interestingly enough, they, they say that uh, it's more like the Scots came over and made themselves king. So there's not the specific emphasis on Edward in the same way that the Scottish sources are very much making huh. it Edward's kind of thing. Whereas the Irish, interestingly enough, also, because Robert Bruce comes over to Ireland during the Irish invasion to help Edward out a bit. 
um, at one right. point. And this is also in the Irish sources, but they one of them calls him the usur- like the usurper king of Scotland as well. So they don't even think that he's oh. <laughs> the proper king of Scotland. So that's quite revealing <laughs> in some ways. Um, yeah. yeah, interesting. <laughs> So they're not they're not a fan in on the whole. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm really interested yeah. in actually at the moment is what he actually gets called because there's one reference. This is the one reference <laughs> that's different yeah. in the Irish Remonstrance, which is this much longer document um, which is written to the Pope by. Well, it says from the Irish, but who exactly that reference right. is a bit questionable. Um, I yeah. see <laughs> them making the case for Edward Bruce as their king based on the fact that the English have, have been tyrants and they haven't done any of the stuff they were supposed to do as the rulers of Ireland. Um, but they, they mention a little bit, like a tantalising bit of Edward Bruce in his court, like giving judgment on a, a case for something. And it also talks about hmm. being very just and, and good. And again, lots of superlatives. Um, but I can't just... find... <laughs> Where else this is? So the the Irish Remonstrance is copied into Bowers Scott Chronicle, which is why we have it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm frantically trying to find. It. I'm like, well, if he's written about this, or the yeah, the person that wrote the Remonstrance is referencing this. Where else can I find um, right this reference? So that was the little rabbit hole that I got stuck down. Ah, uh, yeah, <laughs> trying to trace it back. Um, but yeah, so it, it's tantalizing. I think there's definitely more there to to find. Yeah, yeah. Oh, interesting. Cool. So, can you clarify? I mean, I know and my uh, Irish geography is okay, but can you clarify like what part of Ireland we're talking about that um, mm-hmm. Edward Bruce was invading? Yes, because it wasn't like the whole I- uh, island. <laughs> no, it wasn't. I think they'd like to to talk as if it was. Um, no, it was not. It, so they arrived when they first came over in 1315. They're they're in Ulster, so they come over um, inland. Uh, Oh, near Carrick Fergus, I believe, is one of the first battles. Mm-hmm. I don't remember names off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, so it's the north of Ireland, and they, they have quite a stronghold in Ulster for nearly the entire campaign, um, which makes sense okay. because um, Edward Bruce's, uh, no, Robert Bruce's father in law is the Earl of Ulster. So there is, right. there, although they do kind of fight him, so it's not, it's not particularly amicable necessarily. Oh, Elton. interesting. Um, but they're, yeah, they're, that's where they land and they have a pretty good land base there. And then they do, there are several campaigns in different years where they go kind of south past Dublin to the bottom of Ireland um, and there's a, a hint, there's one letter that's written when they're down the bottom of Ireland to the Welsh to kind of test the waters to see if they would kind of rise in rebellion to kind of help out mm. the invasion which is quite interesting so they get that far south but they kind of come back up again they don't they don't ever take dublin they don't seem to right. take anywhere quite important which might be one of the reasons why this doesn't end up <laughs> being particularly successful in the end um yeah. yeah so he he does he does travel around ireland a fair bit edward Bruce, but yeah it's mainly mainly ulster um, right, and a lot of the Irish kings. So, King uh, Ireland has quite a lot of kings. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, is the way it works in this period. Um, and a lot of them have sworn fealty to Edward. But whether how how true that is is a bit of a, another thing that gets questioned. So, I guess it depends on whether you think he technically conquered those areas or not, and whether those lords actually, those kings, had actually properly um, submitted or not is another question um yeah so yeah but yeah that's that's the broad geographical picture yeah that probably bears explaining just a little bit um more of like what the picture of the the kings and and high king of ireland kind of looked like at that time mm. uh yeah so this is it's, it's, it's another one of these like things that everyone quotes as a thing that like oh yeah the high king of ireland and you try and actually nail mm. it down <laughs> you realize it right yeah, the concept <laughs> to like float away as soon as you try and try and nail it down um but yeah so island island is a lot of different kind of territories with kings and it's it's never to, the argument goes that Ireland's never really had a central king um i guess mm-hmm. it's somewhere similar to wales i think from my broad understanding that there's the odd person who kind of stands up and says i'm the king of ireland and it doesn't really last for very long um but there's this idea of high kingship which is either as again i haven't quite been able to work out whether it's more of a myth or it Mm. yeah i'm sure some people who know irish history better are are horrified at the moment listening to me try and do this um but uh yeah so please do correct me i'd be very interested (laughs) to to talk to you um but yeah there's this there's this idea that ireland's never had a proper king and it's one of the in this period actually the other thing that i find really interesting about all this is that ireland has this has this kind of reputation in europe as being 
not quite as civilized kind of uh, mm. it, well as as it has actually <laughs> in a lot of its history it's the same kind of yeah, yeah. backwards uh idea about Ireland that that's what it, what it's like and one of the theories is oh but and also it's never been able to be ruled by a king because the people are so mm. you know rebellious and that kind of thing um so so yeah they have all these smaller kingships but they've never had a, a high king so it's not like Edward comes over and deposes anyone it's more that he kind of comes over right declares himself king of all Ireland although interestingly the person who's who's kind of believed to have written the Irish Remonstrance. Um, he is, mm-hmm. is someone who, who claims that he is the one who technically has the, the reign of, like, is the inheritor of the kingship of Ireland. So that he's huh. kind of laying claim to it and says, so therefore I'm happy to give it to, <laughs> give it to Edward oh. on behalf of the Irish. Um, but again, it's, it's Interesting. whether that's true, or, like, it, it's, it's quite, it's not a, it's not a very concrete thing. It's almost like, yeah, a, a bit more of a board. Huh. So it's, it's a strange one. <laughs> yeah. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I hadn't I hadn't quite realized that Edward claimed all of Ireland. I thought perhaps he just you know started in the north and tried to work his way. <laughs> yeah, I think it's one of those classic declare yourself king of everything when you start, and then we'll worry about yeah. the actual the actual mechanics behind Ireland. that. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah cool yeah that's such an interesting part of um scottish history because you don't (laughs) scotland doesn't get you know portrayed as an invading country very often no probably because well they're mostly the invaded country i mean i'm sure in parts of england would say otherwise yes the north (laughs) they are the invaders yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah it's that's an interesting thing actually because um one of the theories as well that i'm kind of working on is that um because barbara's bruce is very famous because it's it's it has a lot of famous lines about freedom and the the scottish Mm -hmm. fighting for their freedom from english tyranny and that's kind of it, it, this is the noble cause which they fight for and i think right. this is one of the paradoxes of barbara's bruce is that he spends a lot of time talking about that and then edward bruce effectively does what the english have done to scotland to Ireland. right <laughs> so I, in some ways i think they're almost a little bit i think anyway in the 14th century in the, at the end of the 14th century they're kind of slightly embarrassed by right. this in some ways because it, it does it, it does raise awkward questions about well are you really um yeah quite so different yeah in some ways so yeah i think that might be a very pertinent comment <laughs> for the yeah history. no that is a, a very good point <laughs> oh yeah i do think overall i've gotten the impression that this incident was just kind of more embarrassing than anything else um, yes yeah i, I do yeah. yeah i agree <laughs> and ended up just being a waste of resources and time <laughs> yes yeah and 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 edward bruce himself uh at the, at the time he was Robert had given had put him as next in line to the throne, um, bypassing his own. Yeah. Sister. So it was quite a big deal for him to die as well. Like that's quite that's quite problematic for Robert, yeah. indeed. So yeah, it's it's not good all round. Um. Yeah. No, that's that's interesting. So is there anything Bruce goes and hides in Ireland for a while, doesn't he? Um, before they try to invade. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Earlier on. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Oh, my brain but before they decide that they're going to take over. Yeah, um, yeah that bit. <laughs> is there, uh, this is, you probably don't know because this isn't actually what you're looking at, um, but is there anything in the sources have you found discussing the Scots at that time? Um, not that I found, but I would be interested to try that actually now you say it because um I, I mean i've kind of just been doing because these are online sources the good thing is that you yeah so there's a collection of irish medieval uh sources online which is great there's a database for it um so you can just plug in edward bruce and see what comes up which is mainly what i'm yeah. doing but yeah i hadn't yeah. actually thought of that because that would be quite interesting to establish there's a lot of debate about whether there is actually some affinity between some of the Irish and the Bruces and the Scots in general, yeah. or whether this is mainly propaganda and this kind of made up. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to see how they do describe that and whether it is just some of the Irish liked them and some didn't, and it's the ones that didn't that wrote right. <laughs> articles of the invasion. Or yeah, so like, yeah, I guess yeah, no, but I would like to know. <laughs> yeah, it just it seems like an interesting. I don't know, like I don't even know. I can't remember honestly if Edward accompanied Bruce or Robert, they're both Bruce. Um, (laughs) If the Bruce brothers both went over to Ireland during that time, or if it was just Robert. 
<laughs> yes, no, it is very confusing. I have this because I have to write Edward the first down, and there's two Edwards and two Bruces. So that's how do you yes. on that name? Uh, <laughs> no, no, I don't know. I, I'm also embarrassingly can't remember. I'm frantically just trying to to remember the film of um, the, the recent Netflix film. <laughs> this guy's yeah. to remember whether he goes. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's embarrassing. Um, out loud yeah it's the it's amazing like the things that just you know, skip your brain yeah, yeah um but yeah i i don't know i, I th- would it be kind of interesting to think about or to try to see although probably a fairly impossible task but to see if there's anything that like edward got a i don't know some sort of bug in him about ireland during that trip mm. or something that resulted in his strange behavior later on yes no that's interesting actually i will <laughs> I might note that and see. I'll let you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Or at the very least, to like see a direct comparison on whether the Irish sources were like, "Yay, the Scots are here. They're hiding, but they're here." And then we're like, "Oh, the terrible Scots are killing all of us!" Rah! Yeah, yeah. It's the table turn. Obviously, it's never going to be that cut and dry. But no, unfortunately, not. I wish. Um... <laughs> One can dream. Well, cool. This has been super interesting. I really look forward to to learning more about your research as it comes it's yeah an exciting topic that i've i have always wanted to look into more in detail but just never never had the time thank you thanks for letting me come and talk about it <laughs> yeah no thank you very much for joining me this has been super fun the scotta chronicast is just one of many things relating to medieval history on medievalist.net if you like what you see and what you hear, consider being a patron on patreon.com slash medievalists. Thank you for joining us on the Scotta Chronicast. Please rate and review wherever you get your podcasts, and be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can also follow our account on Twitter, at Scotta Chronicast. Our music is Ex Tilux Oratur by Gaeta. Thanks for listening.